This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 994, recorded on March 23rd, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York... Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. Daniel, just casual uh, inquiries. Seems to me that more people are being infected with SARS-CoV-2. Is that a trend right now? Do you know? Um, you know, it is really hard to get the data anymore, right? It's hard hard to uh, find out what exactly is going on. Um, certain places, I know Canada is having a bit of an issue. The UK ha- is having a bit of an issue. Um, you know, locally, at least when I go to the hospitals, um, there are very few people that are actually, um, you know, SARS-CoV-2 positive. So, okay. um, yeah, it's, you know, the, the biggest challenge is going to be a challenge going forward um, is really knowing because we're not testing, right? It's a lot less testing going mm. on. So, yeah. And, and your ICU is not full of uh, COVID patients anymore, right? No, no. It's a, it's a very different experience um, in the hospital. And what, do you do you have any sense of um, this is my last question for now? Do you have any sense of what fractions of tests actually get reported so that we know how many people are positive in the U.S.? Um, you know, my my impression is the minority because uh, mm. most folks are doing home testing, um, and yeah. you know, and a lot of times that's all we're doing. You know, someone you know someone uh, has consistent symptoms; they have a good story. I saw someone um, who's actually an add-on. Maybe I'll even mention them later on. But an add-on at the end of the day Tuesday, uh, it was a young lady, uh, early thirties, pregnant. Um, she started feeling just crummy, fever, cough, trouble breathing. Um, she did a rapid, it was positive. Um, actually between the time she did the rapid and the time that I saw her, she found out that her grandmother who had just gone to the emergency room was also positive as was her mother. Um, yeah, yeah, in a situation like that, I mean, uh, that, that person's never going to go get a test that's going to be reported. Does your hospital require testing for admission? Um, not, so it's, it's really interesting. A lot of the required testing is going away. So we're not testing everyone who shows up anymore. And do they have to be vaccinated though? Nope. Nope. Wow. No. And actually, um, you know, the Catholic hospitals uh, a little while back actually even just did away with mask mandates. Uh, the Northwell system, no longer mask mandates. Um, you know, the Optum, um, organization, um, we're still, um, whenever you're in a, in a, patient, uh, you know, facing encounter, patient facing situation, you're wearing masks all the time. I think my patients might be a little bit surprised um, if I showed up without a mask on. Um, you yeah, know, I was at yeah. uh, New York Presbyterian this morning, um, masks at all times when you're, you know, in patient uh, care areas, interacting with patients. Um, and I'm still wearing a mask. I wore my mask in on the subway this morning, uh, <laughs> head on into Columbia, and um, um, and I'm wearing masks when I'm around patients. So, but it, it's moving away from the mandates. More of a make make a choice. So you're you're protecting your patients essentially, right? Um, I, and that's what I think the big thing is when a, when a physician um, wears a mask. And patients actually, if you ask patients, most patients would like their physicians to protect them <laughs> by wearing a mask. They themselves might not want to wear a mask. They may not want to protect yeah. their physicians from them. But okay, <laughs> I understand that patients also would like their physicians to be vaccinated. Uh, they, it's interesting. They would, and they definitely want their surgeons wearing masks. You know, when <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> so, okay, and apparently they're big sticklers on hand washing, particularly when it's us who are supposed to be washing our hands. So, Got it. all right. <laughs> well, we'll give you many more times to ask, ask questions as we go, but I will start off with uh, a quotation. Uh, this is by John M. Barry. I'm, I'm working my way through the book, The Great Influenza, The Story of the Deadliest Pandemic in History. Um, it's actually, it's a great book. I have to say, I was a little bit surprised at how good a book it is and how broad the scope is and how much they talk about the history of medicine and really science coming into it and evidence-based medicine um, starting to come in. But here's the quotation. You don't manage the truth, you tell the truth. 
And I think that that's, uh, I think there's a great lesson there. Um, when you start managing the truth and, and, and not just telling people the truth, um, I think it's going to come back and bite you. So. Uh, we'll jump right into the, the first topic. Uh, Vincent, I'm sure you'll like the fact that we're starting off with polio. Um, so the Global Polio Eradication Initiative um, has received notica notification of the detection of circulating vaccine-derived polio virus type 2 in Burundi and um, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, linked with the novel oral polio vaccine type 2. Uh, the viruses were isolated from the stool samples of seven children with acute flaccid paralysis, uh, six in the DRC, eastern Tanganyika and South Kivu provinces, several in Burundi, um, and from five environmental samples collected in Burundi. Um, all reported isolates stem from two separate and new emergencies, emergencies of, the, um, of this vaccine-derived um, uh, polio vaccine. Um, you know, I think this is actually um, important and interesting. And, and actually, I'll, I'll let you comment, Vincent, about why why this is so important. All right. So, so OPV type two has been a problem because when you give it to people, it reproduces in the gut. It gives you immunity, but it also reverts, so it can cause polio. And there are hundreds of cases throughout Africa caused by circulating type two. OPV. So a couple of years ago, an effort was made to modify it so that it wouldn't do that. So it wouldn't cause polio in the recipient and hopefully wouldn't circulate. However, it does cause polio in some recipients. The frequency is much lower than OPV. It's probably 50 times lower, which is great, but it's not zero. So I, I, I don't think we want to keep paralyzing kids with vaccine. But more importantly, and what every story is missing, on this issue. This virus is now in the environment, which means it's going to circulate and cause polio in under-vaccinated populations. And that's just what OPV did, OPV2 did. So this is no different in that property. And that's the real issue here, that uh, the idea that you can have a, an, op an OPV that's not going to circulate just didn't work. And it's too bad. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think it's, it's a good wake up call because there's a lot of optimism and I'm going to leave a link into uh, actually a, a, a the Lancet infectious disease uh, article, a novel tool to eradicate an ancient scourge, the novel oral polio vaccine type two story, um, which gives a nice background about this optimism about, you know, hope, well, the, the hope was that this would not revert to neurovirulence. Well, it's less likely, but once it reverts to neurovirulence, you've now introduced this into the environment. Um, this is why, um, you know, as far as here in the U.S., uh, I, I hope, I don't think that anyone is going to uh, start using the oral, um, even this updated um, novel um, type 2 polio vaccine. Uh, I think we're going to be sticking with the inactivated, which it's inactivated. So it's not replication competent. It's not going to revert. We don't, we don't have this risk. Um, so. I know that Daniel, you cannot bet on a virus not to revert. That's the moral here of this story. Yeah. I feel like this is a Jurassic Park um, lesson. So. <laughs> All right. So let's get right into COVID. I, I think it's funny. I got some communications this last week about people, you know, they, they came for the COVID. Now we, we forced them to learn about other stuff. So I was entertained by that. Um, so, but COVID, right into COVID. And I want to start our COVID section with, um, I will call this a disturbing article, uh, prior COVID-19 infection associated with increased risk of newly diagnosed erectile dysfunction published in the International Journal of Impotence Research. Um, not, not an article that I spend a lot of, you know, not a journal I spend a lot of time reading, but this caught my eye. Um, so using IB Market Scan, which is a commercial claims database, um, I'm actually going to leave a link to a whole paper like what, what is this IBM Market Scan database? Um, but 
using this commercial claims database, um, men with prior COVID-19 infection were identified. Um, they created a cohort using this cohort along with aged matched um, men without prior COVID-19 infection. The researchers assessed the incidence of newly diagnosed erectile dysfunction. Um, covariants were assessed using a multivariable model to determine association of prior COVID-19 with newly diagnosed erectile dysfunction. Um, they ultimately had 42,406 men that experienced a COVID-19 infection uh, between January 2020 and January 2021. So uh, think about the timing there, because that's going to come up. When, when was that relative to vaccines? Well, um, in this group, 1.42% um, developed new onset erectile dysfunction within 6.5 months follow-up. Um, on multivariable analysis, they, they controlled for diabetes, cardiovascular disease, smoking, obesity, hypogonadism, thromboembolism, um, malignancy. Um, with all this, they found that prior COVID-19 infection was associated um, with about a 27% um, increased likelihood of developing new onset erectile dysfunction when compared to those without prior infection. Now, think about those dates. This was prior to the widespread implementation of the COVID-19 vaccine. So this is you're not vaccinated, you get COVID-19. Um, we're basically seeing about one in 60 men are developing um, erectile dysfunction after that infection. So um, if, if there's more than 60 uh, men listening in the audience uh, who now have erectile dysfunction. So uh, just sort of uh, all those people that want to go out there and get, quote unquote, natural immunity. So, Daniel, there's no evidence here from this paper that vaccination blunts this at all, right? So that's what we've got to see now is okay. now we have to, you know, and the great thing yeah. about the IBM market scan, somebody do this study, um, you can go ahead and you can now create a cohort of individuals who are vaccinated and then got infected after yeah, vaccination. Because right. I want to, I'm fingers crossed and everything else crossed that vaccination is going to uh, prevent this from happening. So would, just, would you consider this another symptom of, of long COVID? I mean, it is a post-acute sequelae. Okay. Now, yeah. it's not great, but uh, compared with the other aspects of PASC, there is a treatment for this. So it, it's not the, as bad as it seems, right? Uh, you could have, yeah. I mean, we'll get into quite a bit of a discussion later on about post-acute sequelae of COVID. Um, my gosh, if, if you're going to pick a sequelae, I, I know for some men who are listening, this would be, you know, the world ending for them. Uh, this is not quite as world ending as some of the other post-acute yeah, sequelae. It's treatable, right? It's treatable. Yeah. There's there's that little, uh, the little triangular pill, right? There's the 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 Viagra. The sci I, you don't know what I'm even talking about. I, right. I didn't know it was triangular, <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's move into children, COVID, and um vulnerable populations. Um, so people may have caught uh, the news this last week, um, again, just sharing disturbing things, but the National Center for Health Statistics reported 1,205 uh, pregnant women died in 2021, representing a 40% increase in maternal deaths compared with 2020 and a 60% increase compared with 2019. Remember 2019? That was before COVID. Um, the count includes deaths of women who are pregnant or had been pregnant within the last 42 days from any cause related to or aggravated by the pregnancy. Now, a separate report by the Government Accountability Office has cited COVID as a contributing factor in at least 400 of those maternal deaths in 2021, accounting for much of the increase. So a couple things, right? I mean, one, you could sort of do the math there in your head um, or just repeat it because I just said 400. 400 mothers died in 2021. Um, when the mother dies, you're also usually um, losing the baby. Um, so that that's a real serious number when we talk about um, try to protect um, these pregnant individuals. couple things. August 2021, the CDC came out with unambiguous guidance supporting vaccination for pregnant women, um, and most of the pregnant women who died of COVID had not been vaccinated. Um, and we've discussed uh, quite quite a number of articles about the benefits of 
vaccination for a pregnant individual and also for the newborn. So um, I'll also put right in here an article that I believe um, we discussed previously, adverse maternal, fetal, and newborn outcomes among pregnant women with SARS-CoV-2 infection and individual participant data meta-analysis published in BMJ Global Health, um, where in this analysis, they estimated that unvaccinated pregnant women with SARS-CoV-2 as compared with uninfected pregnant women were at significantly increased risk of maternal mortality, relative risk of 7.68, <clears throat> relative wow. risk of ending up in the ICU, 3.8, and your relative risk of ending up on a mechanical um, ventilator, 15.23. All right. So Daniel, we, I presume in 2022, this number should go down, right? Yes, yes. Um, and I think it's interesting, um, challenging, I guess is probably the right word, is, you know, some of our colleagues out there who are advising um, women considering pregnancy or, or, or who are pregnant, oh, why don't you just wait and let's see. And I, I just think the way we get this number down is by not giving that bad advice. We yeah. get this number down with vaccination. And I am actually going to move into a couple of vaccination articles we have this week. Some some good ones, actually. I think some interesting ones. Uh, the, this article, um, I, I, lo I love, you know, you get the headline, you get what the, uh, the uh, news uh, media um, interprets, and then you actually read the article and maybe you get a different sense. So uh, <laughs> here's the article, Correlates of Protection Against COVID-19 Infection and Intensity of Symptomatic Disease in Vaccinated individuals exposed to SARS-CoV-2 in households in Israel, um, a prospective cohort study published in the Lancet Microbe. Um, and so this was interpreted as large study identifies antibody concentration thresholds that correlate with protection from symptomatic COVID-19. Well, what does the actual science say? So these are the results of a prospective cohort study looking at household contacts in homes in which a new SARS-CoV-2 infection, that's the index case, um, was detected within the previous 24 um, hours. Uh, they included adults aged 18, um, a, a greater than 18 years of age, who had received one or two vaccine doses, had an initial negative sars cov COVID-2 PCR, right? So the baseline not infected, uh, no previous infection reported, um, and then had a valid IgG um, and neutralizing antibody result. And so the, the exposure of interest was the baseline immune status, including this IgG antibody concentration, um, the neutralizing antibody titer, and they also threw in T-cell activation. Um, so the outcome was a PCR positive SARS-CoV-2 infection, between day two and day 21 of follow-up, um, and also looking at intensity of disease symptoms, right? So you got someone in the house, they got the COVID, and now you're looking and seeing um, about these other individuals. Um, and they're, they're gonna do this via a telephone questionnaire. Um, so with this really nice figure two, I, I want anyone who's gonna be reading the headlines to look at figure two, because figure two is really worth looking at um, to really see. Um, and if you look at figure two, um, you know, and, and Vincent, you can you can look at it too, and you can you can tell me if I'm being honest or not. Um, there is a statistically significant difference in the mean, but there really isn't a clear threshold. Um, some people with super high antibodies got infected. Some people with low antibodies did not get infected. There's a correlation, but I'm not seeing this clear cutoff, this this threshold at which you are safe and don't have to worry. No, you're absolutely right, and. The means are very similar between infected and uninfected. But they're statistically different. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Statistician. And so I'm thinking yeah. maybe non-neutralizing antibodies are important. So if you look at the total IgG, it's the same. It looks the same in both infected and uninfected, you know. So not even that yeah. gives you a correlation. Yeah. So I think this is big, right? Because if you, I, you know, I read this headline, right? And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is great. And I'm like, oh, but the science. Well, so right, where so do they get the headlines from? Do they, <laughs> does the journal call them and say, use this headline? I don't get it. They call Dixon actually. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No. And actually, you know, to be honest, or I think to be like, you know, friendly to our, you know, a lot of times the person writing the article doesn't actually get to pick the headline. A lot oh, of times that's, that's like an editor, that's right? They just, yeah. And you're like, what? <laughs> what headline? All right. Um, we also have the article, 
correlates of protection and viral load trajectories in Omicron breakthrough infections in triple vaccinated healthcare workers published in Nature Communications. Um, so these are the results of a prospective cohort study looking at infections in triple vaccinated healthcare workers with and without prior non-Omicron SARS-CoV-2 infection during four weeks in January um, through February 2022. Um, this is the first period of Omicron transmission in Sweden. Um, so hello to our Swedish listeners out there. So during the study period, BA.1, BA.1, one dot one and BA.2 circulated in Stockholm, Sweden, um, allowing for a comparison of these um, infections with the three sublineages post-vaccine, um, the association between serum antibody levels, protection against infection, and viral RNA trajectories were analyzed. Um, and here, I like this. They reported high serum antibody titers are shown to be protective against infection, linked to reduce viral load. And actually, they say that, but then again, in their discussion, they comment that they're looking at RNA and this is not necessarily viral load. So thank you for doing that. And time to clearance. Um, now, um, an interesting section is their discussion of mucosal IgA. Um, they point out that they had recently demonstrated an association between mucosal spike-specific IgA and protection against Omicron post-vaccination infection in this cohort. Um, they report that the addition of mucosal IgG or muco mucosal IgA did not change the risk estimates associated just with looking at serum IgG. Um, in some analysis, they suggest that IgA might be a mediator of the, the effect of prior infection against um, another infection. So the authors go on to say, I'm going to just quote them, taken together, these findings may suggest that while high serum IgG titers protect against infection regardless of mucosal immune responses, the additive protective effect associated to prior infection um, is largely mediated through mucosal IgA and not by serum IgG. And so I, they, have a, they have a different conclusion from the previous paper. They think high <laughs> antibodies do prevent infection. The other paper did not. Yeah. It's, you know, and so I, I, I put in the... Um, I put in the figure and, you know, and, and this is actually an interesting way they did it. And so if you, if you look at figure one, you go down to section C, um, if you actually take people and, and break them apart, um, and I think this is why it's good to have had that other paper in here first. So you say, let's take the people in the um, greater than 75th percentile of the IgG. Let's compare them to people, you know, who are not in that. Then you can sort of see a separation. Um, but it almost makes you think that at an individual level, you can say, oh, I'm in the top 75, I'm doing great. But as you see, if you look at the figure, even the people in the top 75, they're still getting infected. Yep. And most of the people in the lower 75, they weren't getting infected, right? So um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to uh, a question I am getting a lot this past week. Um, and this is the question, you know, Dr. Griffin, it's been a while. So what about another booster now? <laughs> so I will start by saying that, you know, health officials in the UK and Canada have recommended additional boosters for high risk individuals, such as the elderly and nursing home residents. So people are asking, um, I will just get people up to speed. There are ongoing discussions about whether more than one booster per year might be recommended for high risk individuals. Um, and we will certainly discuss when anything happens on this front here in the U.S. Um, but I thought, Vincent, you and I might have a little bit of a discussion about what do we know and what is the mm -hmm. thought here and, and what, what could people realistically expect from another booster? So here I would quote Paul Offit, who put it very clearly, a booster will boost your antibody levels for a couple of months so that it will reduce the likelihood of infection. Three months, let's say, and then you're back to low levels and you're going to get infected. And he says, well, in most people, that doesn't matter. If you're over 75, it could. He's, and he said, and, and you may comment on this, some people, any infection, any little infection puts them in the hospital, right? And so you don't want them. And so for them, maybe you you do frequent boosting. But for the rest of the population, his his view is that frequent boosting is not a good public health strategy as you know. So that's, I, I think that makes perfect sense. And I think if you're in a risk group, just have a plan, as you say, to be treated with an antiviral. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, so I, I think we're all on the same page, and I think that's the realistic thing is boosters boost, but only about three months of that extra, and you're boosting above this 90% durable reduction, and I think that's what um, that's what the literature, that's what the science, that's what Paul Offit and uh, we've been saying repeatedly. But there are certain individuals who you say, you know, it's been six months out, um, you know, we can for three months, let's say, reduce your risk of infection. There may be certain high risk individuals where where it makes sense. And, you know, the science is here, the understanding of the immunology is here. Um, you know, that's not going to change whether or not um, an organization makes a recommendation or not. Um, and so this is this is a reasonable thing to have a discussion with your with your provider, um, you know, what's your risk benefit? What's the, what's your particular benefit for going down this route? But yeah, I would agree. A public health benefit of boosting people, what, four times a year? So you keep at that every three yeah. months. That makes no sense from a public health. Telling everyone to get a booster, again, I don't think that makes any sense. Um, so, Daniel, yeah. are there some populations where we do two influenza vaccines every year? So, you know, interesting, prior to, um, you know, COVID, and, and I think we sort of brought this up, um, there were certain individuals that would get a second flu shot. Okay. Um, and so we've talked a little bit about this. I mean, some some primary care docs will give folks a flu shot in August, and it's sort of part of this whole, like, oh, I give people their flu shot. It's a, how I bring them in for their physical. I'm like, yeah, schedule the physicals in October, November, please. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so if someone got their flu shot in August, and right. now suddenly we're starting to see, like, you know, influenza spiking in March, um, you know, th that person particularly if they're high risk, they're probably better off getting another flu shot. Um, yeah. So. All right. So there's some precedent in certain populations, but not, yeah. certainly not for a year. I mean, that's part of, we talked about this before. It's not even clear what the seasonality of COVID is yet. We know flu is a winter disease here. So yeah. you can do your two shots during the winter. But I mean, if COVID continues during the summer, it makes it difficult to know when to give those two shots, right? Yeah. No. And I think that's, that's huge. So yeah, this is, um, all right, let's move on to the early viral upper respiratory non-hypoxic phase, right? This is, you know, you're acute that first seven days, you're feeling crummy, you're in the viral phase. A um, couple, couple updates here. Um, start with the article. Um, effectiveness of nermotrelvir ritonavir, they should just call it Paxlovid, in preventing hospital admissions and deaths in people with COVID-19, a cohort study in the large U.S. healthcare system published in The Lancet Infectious Diseases. Um, these are the results of a matched observational outpatient cohort study in the Kaiser Permanente Southern California healthcare system. Uh, data was extracted from electronic health records of non-hospitalized patients, that's great, aged 12 years and older, who received a positive SARS-CoV-2 PCR test um, between April 8th and October 7th, 2022. Um, and they had not received another positive test within the preceding 90 days, right? So this is a you know, acute, you just got diagnosed with, with COVID, not just you keep testing positive. They compared outcomes between people who received Paxlovid um, and those who did not by matching cases by date, age, sex, clinical status, um, including care received, presence or absence of acute COVID-19 symptoms at testing, um, lots of other stuff, I will just say. Um, and the primary endpoint was the estimated effectiveness of Paxlovid in preventing hospital admissions or death within 30 days of a positive test. Um, so the study included over 7,000 um, individuals who received Paxlovid, um, and 126,152 folks that did not. Um, they give us an overall estimated effectiveness of 79.6% for this combined endpoint of hospital admission or death. But here's the, the number I really want to hammer home. If these folks were within the first five days and they get started on Paxlovid within 24 hours, 89.6%. Uh, remember, this is during Omicron, mostly vaccinated, right? So vaccinated individuals, we got, let's say, that 90% reduction with our vaccination. We're throwing another 90% reduction, real-world um, data here. Um, 
I will make a couple of comments um, just to sort of be honest here. There's a big difference between an individual's, um, you know, relative risk versus actual risk, right? So we've already gotten that number pretty low for some individuals, right? So if you're 30 years old, you're vaccinated, boy, your risk of ending up in the hospital is already quite small. But let's say you're 92 years old, you've got hypertension, you've got some other medical problems. Um, that's where that 90% reduction is, a, is an actual um, um, significant actual risk reduction or absolute risk reduction, as we'd like to say. So that's the plan, right? If you can take this drug, instead of being boosted so frequently, you take it and it gives you 90% prevention of hospitalization. Yeah, 90% plus another 90%. So 99% with a combination of vaccination and getting your Paxlovid right up front. And don't wait. Don't wait to see how you're going to do. Don't wait till the window closes. Well, when I got when I tested positive last November, I said to you, what should I do? Can I wait and see? And you said, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I, I, I knew I, I shouldn't. I was just <laughs> curious as to what would happen to me because I'm a yeah. scientist, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but you know what? That's a problem. You would have only been an N of one, so. <laughs> yeah, and that would be the only experiment if it failed, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That would be your last experiment. <laughs> All right. Number two, in some areas, we still have access to remdesivir, um, malnupiravir, um, convalescent plasma. Remember, for those immunosuppressed um, folks who have no other options. Um, and let us move on to week two, the early Can I ask, can I ask you a question? I'm sorry. Remdesivir. Yeah, you, you had we had talked about oral remdesivir a while ago. Is there anything happening on that? So there. So at the moment, we don't have access to it. Ongoing studies, but yeah, we're still waiting. We're still okay. waiting. So yeah. got it. Yeah, but I will certainly include that when we have more information. I'm sure. Um, all right. And now week two, remember the cytokine storm? I probably should have just stuck with that. Um, you know, this is when we think about steroids um, after the first week when those SATs are dropping, um, anticoagulation, pulmonary support, immunomodulation. And I'm going to actually spend a little bit of time today, a little bit more than we often do on late um, long COVID PASC. Um, and I wanted to, you know, want to discuss just a couple folks because, um, you know, sometimes these stories, I think, at least for me, really bring things home. Um, you know, I, I recently saw a patient this, um, this week who got COVID this summer um, and actually has now developed really debilitating um, long COVID. Um, and I also saw a physician again, um, sort of a repeat visit, um, who actually just recently um, got COVID and now has long COVID, unable to work. Um, and it was really interesting. The physician was making the comment to me that, you know, early, early on, a lot of people had long COVID. And so they felt like they missed all that camaraderie of being it in together. And now getting long COVID, you know, it's just people are like annoyed by you because, you know, COVID's supposed to be over and they certainly are not supposed to be getting um, long COVID. But I just want to point out this is still happening and still could be debilitating. Um, so I will mention um, an article, SARS-CoV-2 mRNA vaccines decouple antiviral immunity from humoral autoimmunity published in Nature Communications. Um, basically, I'm going to plug TWIV 993. I'm going to leave in a link, um, COVID-19 drives autoimmunity. Um, and really, I, I thought that this was... Um, I thought it, yeah, it's a difficult article, right? Uh, particularly because the title, I don't know if someone made him change the title, maybe it was some editor, right? Um, but really the point here was that if you look at folks that got COVID-19, you see a lot of autoreactive antibodies being generated, quite different from what you see with vaccines, right? So this whole idea that, oh, you just, you saw a spike and, and that's why you're getting all these autoreactive antibodies. The autoreactive antibodies are actually quite common something we, we certainly see in COVID-19, um, but rare probably with vaccines, at least based upon um, this research. Um, so I, I did want to make the comment that um, vaccines are not just about preventing severe disease and death. Um, they also have this um, effect upon preventing um, post-acute sequelae of COVID. And as we've actually talked before, some of the preventive and therapeutic um, impacts for PASC. Um, I also want to give people a heads up on another one of these studies looking at, um, can I treat my folks with long COVID with Paxlovid? Will, will it make a difference? Is it an effective treatment? Um, and our friends up at Yale, so Harlan Krumholtz and Akiko um, Iwasaki, 
um, they actually have started this trial, and it's a decentralized trial. Um, it's a randomized, double-blind, um, superiority, placebo-controlled study um, where folks do not require site visits. If you're in um, Connecticut, Florida, New York, uh, you can enroll. So sort of an interesting tri-state, not, not the tri-state, but a tri-state. Um, and they'll actually deliver the study drugs to the participant's address. Uh, so we can leave in uh, links here to the study team's phone number, 203-497. 1246 and Yale PAX study at yale.edu. So um, I know there's another study going on at Stanford, so it's always great to have um, more access. We have more evidence based guidance. Um, but one of the challenges I want to talk about, um, and I want to say this in, in a positive way, is that we do actually have ways of approaching and helping folks with long COVID. Um, I actually was communicating today with uh, the folks that, that run our post-COVID recovery center here. Um, um, I don't know what we are right now. I guess we're Optum. We used to be pro-health. Um, but, but how do we approach this? And this is just sort of a, a, a straightforward approach. We usually start by spending a lot of time on the history um, and trying to understand when did the symptoms start and then trying to identify what symptoms are um, affecting the patient, uh, looking at cardiac, looking at pulmonary, gastrointestinal, neurological, um, I'll say immune. Um, and then as we talked about new diagnoses, people, um, you know, now they have diabetes, now they have thyroid, now they have adrenal, um, now they might have erectile dysfunction if we ask. Um, important to know what the timing of the first COVID infection, timing of reinfections, timing of COVID vaccinations, because that may actually um, have an effect upon um, you know what we recommend. Um, have they been hospitalized? How often are they accessing the medical um, system? What have they tried so far? What are they trying now? How have they done with those different things? And they're really, I, I want to point out there are a lot of um, system specific things that we can focus on. Um, if it's a cardiac issue, we will often involve cardiology. Um, if we're concerned about um, POTS, um, and that's postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, um, we might go ahead and do tilt table testing. We might do a NASA 10 minute lean test. Uh, we might talk about sodium supplementation, um, fluid, increased fluid intake, but be careful with those sugary drinks because sometimes sugar can be a trigger for these individuals. Um, there's a number of medications, flugicortisone, certain but not all beta blockers, avoiding alcohol, certain types of physical therapy, even aquatic therapy. With arrhythmias, we have medications to address that. Um, chest pain, determining whether or not it's an ongoing inflammatory process, um, looking a lot at post-exertional issues, pacing as we've discussed. Um, when it comes to pulmonary, we might see cough, we might see dyspnea, we might see uh, pulmonary function abnormalities. And interesting, we were discussing today, we're seeing a lot of nuance at sleep apnea, something important to recognize and address. Um, some folks, it's a GI involvement predominant. Um, so sometimes we're using our famotidine rather than our PPIs, sometimes antihistamines. Interesting enough, sometimes we're using Montelukast or Sigulair, um, which is actually a leukotriene receptor antagonist. Um, sort of interesting. A lot of times people have a headache when we start it and then we restart it. Um, neurological, right? A lot of new onset migraines. We can handle migraines. We have a lot of medications. We can work with neurologists. Um, just want to really let people know that if you're suffering out there, reach out, find a provider who's familiar with this. And actually we can, in most cases, um, make a difference. And I will wrap it up there. Um, low and middle income countries, remember there's a whole big world out there. No one is safe until everyone is safe. And I do want everyone to pause the recording right here. Go to parasiteswithoutborders.com and click donate. Even a small amount helps. Um, and we're now in the middle of our American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene fundraiser. Uh, February, March, and April, uh, donations will be doubled up to a maximum donation of $30,000 for American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. It's time for your questions for Daniel. You can send them to daniel at microbe.tv. Hannah writes, first off, thank you for your consistent, honest COVID, other infectious disease info. Your updates on TWIV have been very helpful as I seek to guide my family medicine patients through the COVID maze, MD at a small clinic hospital. My question, what is the long-term efficacy data for the bivalent COVID booster in non-pregnant adults 
of average risk under age 65 from articles I've read and your discussions on the podcast. I'm not picking up strong data behind the booster, at least for severe disease protection beyond two to three months, especially in this lower risk group. Seems that the original two dose mRNA series continues to be the mainstay of protection. I strive to give my patients all the data we have, not popular opinion, want to make sure that I'm representing the science correctly. So thank you for writing in. Thank you for your kind words. Um, you know, hopefully our discussion today um, helped with this. Um, you know, boosters do boost that, that three-month reduction in infection. If you don't get infected, you can't have severe disease. Um, you know, and then you get into what we talked about, relative risk reduction versus absolute risk reduction. Um, if you have a significant risk of severe disease, then your actual um, absolute risk reduction is going to be significant. But if you've already reduced that quite a bit, so we're talking about young, healthy individuals, um, then um, you know the absolute risk is not going to be that significant. Uh, but remember, if if that young, healthy individual gets pregnant or there's any other issue that significantly increases their risk, right? We talked about a 15-fold increase of ending up on a mechanical ventilator if you're pregnant and gets SARS-CoV-2. Um, yeah. So um, hopefully our ongoing discussions will help inform you. Wouldn't you say that the three-dose mRNA series is what we should be doing for everyone? I, I think it's a three-dose series. Yeah. I think we're almost, well... I don't want to like operate by consensus, but I would say the science, <laughs> the preponderance yes, yes. of data would support this as a three-dose vaccination series. Uh, M writes, I was wondering if you could explain the difference between a cytokine storm and septic shock. To the best of my understanding, both terms describe an acute overwhelming immune response triggered by an infection that leads to organ failure and potentially death. I also know there's a certain amount of disagreement or controversy when it comes to defining both of these terms. What is the difference between the two or is there a difference? Yeah, so there is there is a difference actually. And so thanks for asking. And I'm, I'm gonna try to answer this broadly and then I'm gonna ratchet it down and focus on in the context of COVID. So, you know, the, the concept of cytokine storm for a lot of us, our, our approach and understanding of it came from CAR T therapy. So I don't know if people have uh, listened to other TWIVs or maybe even immune. Um, and this is where we actually re-engineer a person's uh, T cells and give them these chimeric antigen receptors. And one of the problems is as those T cells expand, uh, usually using it to fight a cancer, this can um, trigger this tremendous um, cytokine storm. Um, and you end up with different levels of different um, cytokines. So, uh, you know, interferon gamma, IL-1 beta, um, and actually, because what you're deciding or trying to decide in these often young kids is, are they having um, a cytokine storm? from the CAR-T, and you're going to treat this with immunosuppressants, right? Maybe steroids, might be IL-6 inhibition, or did they get an opportunistic infection? You want to jump in with antibiotics. So um, you can actually use a combination in um, CAR-T therapy, um, checking interferon gamma, checking IL-1 beta, trying to make a distinction there. Now, in COVID, let's go to COVID. COVID, it's week two or three. You're trying to decide... Um, you know, the drop in blood pressure, the fever, all this inflammation. Is it coming from the cytokine storm of COVID? Is it coming from a secondary infection, maybe bacterial or fungal? Um, you know, we're doing blood cultures. We're um, looking for bacterial fungal infections. Maybe we're uh, doing a history, a physical. Um, and here, different parameters. Sometimes we'll actually use a ferritin procalcitonin ratio. The inflammation um, of COVID um, is going to cause your procal to rise, but it's going to cause your ferritin to shoot way up. Where in a bacterial infection, you'll end up with something of a rise in ferritin, but a much more significant rise in procal. So a ferritin procal ratio of less than 800 is going to help steer us more towards a bacterial sepsis relative to a COVID cytokine storm. All right. <laughs> Okay, I have a, and then she, M has a silly question. If an infection were spread to me from petting my dog, would she be considered a vector or would her fur be a fomite? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. So, I, you know, if the dog is healthy and let's say someone's got the flu or nor, norovirus, I'm going to use norovirus here, and they, they're, you know, not cleaning their hands and they're petting your dog for comfort. And then the dog comes over and you pet the dog and the dog stays fine. But then I'm going to call the dog a uh, fomite, a yeah. moving fomite. I would agree. 
Okay. All right. Sam wants to know if the New York rats have COVID, can humans catch it from rat breath? So we got to do the studies. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know, but how are you going to get close enough to a rat to, to breathe yes. in? It's, I don't think that's likely. <laughs> All right. And finally, Michael writes, recently a pediatric patient presented for needle phobia in treatment for acquired aplastic anemia, which her parents attributed to complications from the COVID-19 vaccine. Do you have a clinical comment on the parent's perception? Is it just as likely that the patient had asymptomatic COVID and unfortunately developed the sequelae? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, this this is going to be a hard, yeah, it's going to be hard uh, to know what happened there. So, yeah, um, you're on your own. <laughs> tough to know. That's TWIV Weekly Clinical Update with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. All right. Thank you. And everyone, be safe. 